This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. So it's uh, 7 o'clock. I see a quorum, so I will call the August 1st meeting of the Waterways and Parks Commission to order. First item of business will be the approval of minutes from the June 27, 2018 meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, do we have a movement to approve the minutes? I um, move. Second? Second. I think uh, Megan got it for you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. First item of new business is the recommendation on a variance to allow a single family home at 1307 First Avenue that would be at a 23 and a half foot setback from the top of the bank of the Chippewa River instead of the code required 40 feet. Uh, Pat? Uh, Antone Spence and Ray Schilling Spence who are here tonight are requesting a variance to construct the new single family house at 1307 First Avenue that would be approximately 23.5 feet from the top of the bank of the Chippewa River. As mentioned, the code requirement is, is 40 feet. On the map here, uh, this shows the location of the subject parcel, uh, First Avenue, uh, the Chippewa River, and then uh, Beach Street. Will uh, the development guidelines for the waterways and greenway areas, uh, which were included in your packet, uh, state that the setback should be 40 feet from the top of the bank unless the variance is approved. Uh, the site plan showing the proposed house uh, with the building elevations were also included in your packet, and I'll go through those in just a minute here. Uh, the parcel in question, if you walk by the parcel, is cur currently vacant. Uh, there was a house on that previously, and that that has been removed uh, within the last year or so. Uh, the information provided in your packet uh, notes that the house uh, was, was removed in 2017. That previous house uh, was located at a setback of about 19 feet. Uh, this new house would be located essentially at that same setback, that same footprint uh, that would be about nine, about, uh, that would be set back at about 19 feet. Uh, the house to the north uh, which would be located right here, uh, which is 1309 First Avenue, and set back at approximately 19 feet from the top of the bay. And then the house to the south, which is at uh, 1227 First Avenue, uh, there's a garage located there, and that's located at about 19 feet from the top of the bay. That actually was approved as part of a variance uh, that went through with Parks and Waterways and the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, back a few years ago. Uh, the code does allow encroachments for uh, decks into the setback up to 10 feet from the top of the bank. As I review the site plan, you'll see that the proposed house does show uh, decks, uh, and they are in conformance with the Greenway guidelines. Uh, the comprehensive plan uh, calls for the extension of the recreational trail along Long First Avenue here. Uh, right now, the trail stops at the north side of uh, Madison Street right here. Our plans are to go under Madison Street. Uh, we have a uh, trail right away uh, uh, reserved when Lazy Monk uh, purchased the uh, Charles Lumber Company from the city. We reserve land along the river. So the trail will come under Madison Street along this area here, and then we come out to First Avenue. Uh, back in 2017, we had a discussion about uh, the vacation of, of Beach Street here. And, uh, discussion was with the Planning Commission and the City Council. Uh, it was decided at that time, and I'll show some maps, but it was uh, the plan still is to extend the recreational trail along First Avenue, uh, but we would be looking at two options. Uh, one would be to extend the trail along the, the boulevard between the street and the sidewalk. We have a 20-foot uh, boulevard, so it's a much larger boulevard than what you normally see within the city. So we could easily extend the trail within that boulevard or uh, when we reconstruct First Avenue, we could do a, uh, a design similar to what we did with Thorpe, Thorpe Drive, kind of a Warnorf type of a design. Uh, so our plans still are to extend the, uh, the trail. The thought uh, by the city manager, the planning commission, the council was rather than to acquire these homes at that expense, uh, was to encourage uh, redevelopment along this area. 
this part of the neighborhood, and we could still get that trail along this section of Pocoga River. The uh, recommendation of the Parks and Waterways Commission that will go to the Zoning Board of Appeal they meet next, next Tuesday. Uh, these are the waterway guidelines that we have uh, included in the packet, as I mentioned before. The, the current standard is uh, 40 feet from the top of the bank. These were uh, amended uh, back when we adopted the new waterways plan about three or four years ago. The previous guidelines stated that uh, the setback was 30 feet from the ordinary high water mark. Uh, so this was a substantial change going from that to 40 feet from the top of the bank. And this is the uh, existing uh, configuration of somewhat. Uh, uh, this is uh, First Avenue located uh, to the bottom of the map here. Chippewa River located here. This is the, the steep river bank right now. Uh, this is the house uh, to the north that we talked about that had a 19-foot setback. Uh, this is the house to the south, and this is the garage that is at the 19-foot setback that we talked about before. Uh, this is showing the uh, house that was on this lot, showing that it was at about that 19-foot setback. Uh, this, as I mentioned, this has been re removed. If you go out and look at the lot right now, it's just an open lot right now. This is the proposed construction, again with the house to the north at 19 feet, uh, the house to the south uh, with the garage at 19 feet. Uh, this would be the setback of the line of the house itself right here, that would be about 23 and a half feet from the top of the bank that's located right here. And then as I mentioned, they are showing uh, some decks to the back, uh, but they're uh, well further than 10 feet from the top of the bank, which is, is a code requirement. Uh, elevations of the house. Uh, this would be the elevation here that would be facing First Avenue. Uh, the left elevation, uh, which would be the south elevation, uh, no, which would be the, the north elevation. Uh, this would be the south elevation. And then the elevation facing the, the river uh, would be this elevation right here. And these would be the decks that are, are shown here. The um, this is the aerial of the uh, vicinity. First Avenue, uh, the Chippewa River, and then Beach Street located right here. So the uh, parcel in question is uh, this uh, parcel right here. If you've gone out to the site or if you're familiar with the site, the main channel of the Chippewa River is over in this area here. There actually is a, uh, a uh, I don't know if you want to call it an island or kind of a peninsula, uh, but this is a, a area that has vegetation on it and then this is kind of like a backwaters of the Chippewa River located in here uh, that these houses front on. The, if I can zoom in here a little bit, you can see this, uh, this is the parcel in question here. This is the uh, lot line right here, and uh, the actual street line, I see it better at this lot here, this is the lot line here, this is the street, and this is the sidewalk here. So this, there's a 20 foot uh, spacing between the, uh, in the slot line and, and the curb here. So what we would do if we wanted to uh, put the trail in here, we, we would remove this sidewalk and just basically center that trail within this 20 foot area. Typical trail that we are looking at now, uh, we like to go about 12 feet in width, uh, so there'd be substantial width there with that 20 feet in order to extend that trail along there. And as I mentioned, an alternative to that would be uh, just a total redesign of First Avenue when we get to that point and design it more in terms of a, a multi-use street for pedestrians, bicycles, and for, uh, uh, and for, for vehicles. Uh, and again, this is showing the, the house that was removed from, from, the, from the site. This shows the uh, parks plan, and this uh, the 
resolution is not the greatest here, but this is uh, Madison Street located right here. Uh, the existing uh, cannery trail that we installed last year is located in this area here. Uh, the Lazy Monk Brewery is located here. So this section of dark green, this is where we are showing that we do want to extend the recreational trail from Madison Street uh, down to uh, the Phoenix Park Bridge that would be located right here. So we are showing that that is uh, in, in our plans and we do want, want to do that. So with that, I guess if you have any questions of me, the applicants are here, and uh, I'll go back to the, uh, the original master. So at, uh, you mentioned that the code was 40 feet. Is it is it really the building code, or I see the 40 feet figure here under just the guidelines? Uh, the way we have uh, our code set up is it within our zoning ordinance have specific uh, setbacks from streets and then we also have special provisions for along waterways. Uh, within the waterways then in our zoning code it refers to what we refer, refer to as the waterway guidelines. So that 40 foot is an established or uh, distance as a requirement uh, but uh, we can vary that through the, through the uh, zoning <coughs> variance process. And what we're, some of the things that we look at in this particular case here is the 40 feet would be ideal in, in the perfect world. Here we're looking at uh, what some of the existing buildings are in that vicinity. Uh, so in this case, the proposal is not to go any closer uh, than, than what was before. Actually, this building will be set back about four and a half feet further than the original the building that was there previously and it'll be set back a couple of feet further than the buildings on either side. So they're not increasing the, uh, the uh, that's, that setback that was there yeah, originally. Large, larger building than the setback. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then um, with regard to the decking, mm -hmm. is that mentioned in place, or is it an oversight that it isn't mentioned, do you think? Or well, the deck What would have... prevent it from putting a deck as big as a tennis court deck? Well, he, uh, with this proposal, when this, with the Parks and Waterways and then the Zoning Board, uh, this is what's being proposed. So uh, if he wanted to change that, he'd have to come back to the Parks and Waterways, he'd have to come back to the Zoning Board. But the zoning and guidelines don't really comment one way or the other on what's a reasonable decking. Yeah, the zoning only indicates that they can't go any closer than 10 feet to the top of the bank. You said something about um, buying up the properties. That's that's been that's not something that's that was actually uh, at the time that uh, that uh, back at the time when a couple things happened back a few years ago. Uh, one was uh, when uh, when Mr. Smets requested the, the vacation of Beach Street. The the south portion of Beach Street was vacated a number of years ago, but the north portion wasn't for some, for some reason. Uh, when Mr. Spetz came forward and wanted to purchase this lot, uh, he's the one that requested to have this section of Beach Street vacated. And that, when that request came forward, that prompted the discussion in terms of should we be buying these properties or not. Next, there was a, another uh, property further to the north. It was either this property or this one. I'm not sure which, but that uh, came for sale uh, back a few years before that, and uh, we presented that uh, to the city manager. We had a discussion, uh, and, and it was felt at that point in time, rather than spending the funds, there's 14 properties there, and rather than spending uh, the money to acquire all 14 of those properties, that we we had sufficient right away to uh, to extend the trail. What happened after that then is that uh, uh, as part of our comprehensive plan, we took a look at, there was a, uh, an emphasis on neighborhood revitalization that occurred back in 2015-2016. Uh, we had a neighborhood task force that uh, was put together and one of the recommendations was trying to encourage uh, redevelopment, encourage revitalization of some of our older neighborhoods. And, uh, this was identified as one of those areas that we felt we could 
probably see some, uh, some revitalization, some new development occurring there uh, that would benefit some of the older neighborhoods. So this is something that we feel would be beneficial to the city. Yes. But I think it's interesting that we have recreational property on both sides. We have the river, which we want. We don't want to have people nudge up too close to the river. But then on the street side, we're having the bike trail, and we want to have you know ample space for the bike trail. So it seems that this lot is is kind of squeezed right in between two uh, things that the city is concerned about. Um, and I, and it appears that the previous footprint was kind of in the middle. And if we uh, try to maintain the setback for the river, we may be squeezing the bike trail. And uh, it just seems to me that, and if it lines up with everything else, uh, all the other properties, like to the north and to the south, that, and if it's on the existing footprint, it seems to me that uh, that I would be in favor of, of supporting uh, the exception of, of the setback. Hey, Pat. Um, so the, the point of the many of the properties are a similar setback from there. Um, it, well, I specifically mentioned where the garage was approved at some point in the pre recent history. Other houses are there, are they there because they were built before these guidelines were established, or have they gone through similar zoning appeals? Do you, can you speak to any of the other properties along this path that are also less than 40 feet? Uh, they were all built uh, prior to this. They were built, I don't have specific dates, but these probably were built back in the 30s, maybe 40s or so, so uh, well before we had any, any uh, guidelines. One thing, you know, I, I should, I kind of, I mentioned, but I can kind of, refer to with the aerial here is, is prior to 2017, which is recent history, is that our requirement was uh, 30 feet from the ordinary high water mark. So what, what that would have meant, so in this case, for the house that we're talking about here, ordinary high water mark uh, would have been about where the blue line is here. So we would have essentially measured back 30 feet from that about this point here. What that really would have meant in this case is that the house would have essentially been allowed pretty much at the top of the bank. So under the new guidelines with 40 feet, uh, at least at this point we're, we're having that setback of 23 and a half feet versus two years ago they would have been able to go right at the top of the bank. So, so there's been a substantial change right there in that two years. Um, what was the reason the previous house was removed? It was removed for this for this purpose. For this purpose. Essentially, the, the the process was set in motion at the time when the uh, plan commission and the council agreed to have this section of Beach Street uh, vacated. Essentially, it was done to allow this to happen. Pat, could you go to the development guidelines? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to maybe clarify, the first line is, in order to minimize any adverse effects on the waterway environment and enhance the, well, the first adverse effects, what kind of, can you speak to what kind of adverse effects they were, one was concerned about when this language was drafted? Or is that really not something you're definitely privy to? Well, I think the, uh, to minimize any adverse effects on the waterways environment and enhance the appearance and image of these areas, I think probably the key in, in this particular situation in terms of having the setback is to enhance the, the appearance and the, the image of these areas, basically to, to allow it to have some additional green space uh, set back between the waterways and any building, so that that's really what we're looking at. Do you think anything like um, erosion or runoff was a concern, or is it more 
appearance of the waterways? Or? Well, it, it depends on the type of development. Uh, in this case here, it's probably more appearance. If we we're looking at a more of a commercial application there, we would be looking at uh, possible siting of uh, parking lots and uh, dumpsters and signs and those types of things. There, is, there we would probably get into a, the issue of more minimizing the adverse uh, effects of a development. In this case, where we're looking at a house or a residential, uh, we're really looking at more just trying to make sure we provide some uh, green space or open space between the river and the structure itself. It, it's a steep bank down to the water, right? From, Correct. So is there to be a staircase or is there to be access to the water from the lot? Uh, you, you can ask the applicant when we get to that in terms of if they have any plans to do that. They, they, they certainly could choose to do that if they wanted to. And is, this seems like it's a much larger structure than the surrounding areas. Can you just, is it just the outline to the left part of the lot close to the from house to the north? Or which part of the lot is to be occupied? Well, this what is, is the outline of the house? Is I guess footprint of the house. I guess is this what I'm is saying. the outline of the house yeah. right here. That's the white green. This is what it used to. Look and so it's like, and that sort of five-sided thing there is that um, driveway or what is this that? This here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is pavement. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a joint act, joint driveway that would go into. To the, actually, you know, this is a, an attached garage that's built in right here. So this is a driveway going into that garage, and then the driveway goes over to this garage here. So, so, so it's one, one driveway for both properties. So that was the reason to completely vacate the seat? This, well, it was also, for, also to provide for, uh, for a setback in terms of uh, a setback on the, the south property line by vacating it. There is a, uh, a uh, utility uh, stormwater easement that goes through here. So they're, they're, they were not allowed to, to build in this area here because of that utility easement, but they, they could use that for setback purposes. Are they more, uh, Kirk? So just so I understand clearly, uh, the city's plan would actually encourage a development like this in the interest of revitalization. That's that's the direction our city manager was going. So these other houses, uh, you know, some in some areas they have restrictions on how much you can rehabilitate a house, and once it's beyond repair, it can't be replaced. But there's no kind of restriction like that. It's, uh, well, there. The one thing that I was going to mention also is there are some uh, floodplain issues along First Avenue too, and I think the applicant can discuss that a little bit. But as part of this this project, the the uh, it's my understanding that the site will be raised about a foot in order to comply with the floodplain regulations. So some of these other houses uh, to the south and to the north. Uh, could be subject to uh, some of the 50% uh, uh, improvements unless they uh, comply with the flood time regulations. So there's those issues to deal with also. Maybe we'll hear more, but does that, taking care of the floodplain issue on one property can have an adverse effect on the other properties? Uh, that's something that the, uh, I guess you could ask the applicant on that. Hmm. Are there any more questions for Pat? Would the applicants here um, would you like to address the commission? Or first of all, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you. I, um, if you wouldn't mind, we'd be able to stand up uh, to the front to see better. Thank you. Okay. The water thing? Sure. Okay. Good Good evening. My name is Anton Smets. My wife's name is very silly in the bag. Thank you for coming tonight. That uh, uh, is a 
good thing. Uh, the history uh, a little bit. We own the property next door, so the, the property to the to the south uh, is a property that we own. Um, so the idea of uh, buying this house was the first plan. Really, was to see if we could uh, rebuild this house. Uh, it was basically a, a fairly sound structure in the, the center square, and it had three additions. And the additions were all uh, severely saved. So uh, we we spent uh, six months trying to talk to people about what we could do. And the biggest restriction that Pat referred to was the limitations on how much money we could spend if we would uh, keep this property, you know, the 50% of the value. That uh, all all that really would do us. It would enable us to build a new basement, and then we didn't have a house. Um, so then we thought about uh, maybe putting another house on it. We uh, we are a couple who looked at maybe putting the historic home on the site. If that would be possible, uh, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, the building of the new house, and that goes to your question, uh, ma'am. Because we need to take it out of the floodplain, uh, only one quarter of the existing house was in the floodplain, but that, that puts the whole property in the floodplain. And we needed to have 15 foot site, uh, uh, what's that called? Uh, 15 foot uh, building envelope around, uh, and around the structure, structure rather than the eight foot. And so that's why we hired Ed's company to kind of figure out if we had that. And since we we, we not only, we, we started with the vacation of the Beach Street, which would have given us just enough, but since we own the property next door, we could redraw the lines if that was necessary in terms of giving, giving that uh, option. Um, the, um, there was a question about the tennis court and, and the, the access to the river. Uh, we, we do now live on the river on the other side of the river. We did build an access stairway and a little dock. Uh, I, I, I can't, I have to look at Ray here, but with great certainty say that that's not anything we plan to do. The, the variation of the water in what we call the sleuth, you had a different word for it, is so dramatic. Sometimes there's no water at all, and sometimes there's a whole lot. It's a constantly changing thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the structure of the, the bank is, is kind of hazardous. Uh, I, I certainly think we won't play any tennis there because we don't want to chase the ball. It's dangerous. There wouldn't be any good reason to build something done. It's not that you have water that you can put a canoe in or something like it's too, uh, too much variability or a boat. The, the river doesn't lend itself for that. Uh, clearly, uh, yeah, great downtown supporters, our, our dream is to, to live on the river still, but be very close to downtown. And, and uh, if we can ever support the idea of having a wood air for the Thorpe Commons on the first half, we would be thrilled. That'd be an absolutely great idea for that whole development. And frankly, we hope uh, the neighbor to the north uh, will also uh, start to remodel the house. We, we really hope that in 10 years or so, uh, people will follow our idea of either building new houses or remodeling them. Uh, the house to the north, two up, is delightful. It was a kind of an older barn uh, type house. It's just a pleasure for the eye right now. And uh, if that is not only the, the future of First Avenue in that stretch, uh, there's also uh, the incentive that it will yield a lot more tax money, obviously, with more expensive houses. We know we are very aware that we're taking a risk. We've done a lot of real estate development in our years. We know the rule, you shouldn't have the most expensive house on the block. And we're, gonna, we're not going to do that this time. Uh, but
But we really do believe that this is the beginning of something that might work very, very well. As far as the water thing, man, I, if you could address that, if, if us being higher will flood the neighbors, I really don't know what to say about that. Sure. Um, it's the, the, the area in the lot that we're filling is in the flood, flood fringe. Um, so it's in the flood plain, but it's not in the flood way. So um, any filling in the flood plain has been accounted for in the FEMA you know, studies and, and, and flood studies. Um, if we were to build in the flood way, which would be out on the bank, let's say, um, th that would have po possibly an effect, but otherwise this you know, this is not going to have any adverse effect on neighboring properties. Um, like Tom had said, uh, we're raising it about a foot um, on, on kind of one half of it. Uh, the rest of it is is above the floodplain, but then we're going to, you know, be built bringing the house up so it's two feet above the flood elevation. Um, and, and, and then, oh, from the building, there will be a, a, a fill envelope 15 feet around, and at the edge of the property, there will be a short, just one foot high retaining wall. And the way the drainage sits right now, uh, it doesn't appear that that should cause any problems whatsoever. Um, the, the drainage off the lot flows uh, everywhere, kind of out towards the street and then out towards the river um, right now. And, all the pavement is draining to, to the street, um, not to the river. Uh, the, it's, it's more or less um, you know, taking the, the place of what was there before that, that, that was removed. And the, the, the FEMA uh, 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 approval came two days ago, so they look at that and that's part of what they do. They've looked at our plan and uh, you know, we send them a plan, this is what we plan on doing, this is what we plan on removing from the floodplain. They approve the plan that allows um, uh, the planning department to sign off on a plan for uh, them to fill the lot. The lot will be filled by a contractor to the certain elevation. Our company will verify the elevation was raised to the adequate, you know, the elevation that was set with the uh, with FEMA, and then we'll certify that it's set, and then there will be a letter of map or amendment um, with FEMA. So a letter of the, the floodplain map that this structure and the 15 foot area around the structure has been removed for the floodplain for purposes of you know flood insurance rate maps and. For instance, down the road, if anybody would, you know, any of these other homes would would like to do that, they're they're they they they're able to do that, go through that process, and and not have to pay flood insurance in the future. The house map about your question is actually not that much bigger than 1227, the neighboring house. It seems a little bit bigger because the garage is part of the structure, but square footage-wise. 1856 square foot on the first floor. The, the house next door is 1460, so it's not all that much bigger. Are there any questions for the applicant from the commission? Uh, Matt Apple, A P P E L, and I'm with Advanced Engineering Concepts. Discussion on the matter at this point? So I'm guessing if we approve this, it has to do with the setback, and we're not considering ourselves with the flood plan and the other, you know, FEMA and so on and those kinds of things. So, Pat, our, our decision here will be forwarded to the Zoning Board of Appeals, who would take it in consideration as part of her overall review of the process? 
Yes, uh, your action is a, is a recommendation that will be forwarded on to the zoning board. They actually will make the determination on the variance itself. So your review primarily relates to the Greenway guidelines in terms of how you feel the project uh, uh, relates to those guidelines uh, for the river. So is it not true if there, if you don't allow a variance there for new construction, there won't be any new construction? Because it appears to me that if you go back the whole 40 feet, that's a very skinny house. That, that, that's correct. If you, were, you you'd have to go back another 17 feet, roughly, probably, to about this point here, or two. So it's not necessarily impossible, but you're making it much less feasible to do something. Actually, I'm sorry. I did have a question from Mr. Apple there. Um, would you make consideration of trying to meet the setbacks, or did you, in your opinion, were you just unable to um, put something within a 40 foot setback? Uh, we're held to the uh, the front setback um, of the house, so we can't have it any closer to First Avenue. Currently, where is it? Is yes. It could be the first Avenue. And uh, they looked at different building plans, and we I think you guys narrowed the building plans down substantially, um, given once we determined where the top of the bank was, you know, to try and fit a house any house on the lot. Um, if you look, the house right now is 38 feet deep, uh, which is, I think, fairly narrow. Um, and so another 17 feet, say, would leave you with a 20 foot, 21 foot wide house. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, we did look at multiple options uh, and went over it with them. Thank you. Sure. Any other further discussion on the matter? Well, it just, it just seems to me that the um, we want that street just like as we do most of our streets along the river to be uh, developed and maintained and, and that, that property is going to be in better shape if there's a, a residence on there. Uh, the problem probably occurred long ago when they plotted out First Avenue. I mean, you think about the, how this thing came to be. They put First Avenue there and then we decide that there's going to be setbacks from the street and then now we have setbacks from the water and I mean, we've, we've got a situation where it's, it's you're going to have to build a really unique home in order to meet all of those restrictions. Uh, I don't see a, a huge, I don't see any adverse adversity in terms of having uh, a structure put on this property uh, with that type of setback, to having that have any adversity on the river or on the smooth the backwaters of the river. Given that, I would approve or I would move that we uh, approve this recommendation or this request for something. I'll second that. Um, okay. Um, all in favor of the recommendation, uh, please. No, but saying aye. 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 Um, all opposed? I'll say no, but um, just because that's not important. But that being said, the vote is six to one in favor of approval of the uh, the allocation. So, okay, that's all on that one. Um, so, approved. So, feel free to say or feel free to leave meeting because it's all the same information stuff for us afterwards. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, part three of the approval of the Senate and Distance Meeting is the 2018 Special Events List. We are uh, getting a lot of special events in the city of Eau Claire, which uh, certainly has made for uh, a lot of fun uh, in the city. 
I won't go through all of these, but I will touch on a few um, that um, Food Truck Fridays, I think I talked about it. I, I have a little uh, something in the director's report on that, I believe, too. But um, that was a big hit downtown. Uh, certainly that started, uh, the first one was uh, back in, uh, I believe, was it before our July meetings did not happen, but we had our first uh, Food Truck Fridays down at the railroad uh, uh, parking lot. Um, they estimated well over a thousand people uh, down there on that day. Um, the next Food Truck Friday will be on this Friday. So if you get an opportunity, I would encourage you to perhaps stop down there. Um, they did run out of food last, the last one. So they are uh, setting that up to have a little bit more. Uh, uh, more, more trucks to do this thing? Well, they, they, they were planned to have seven, and I think the layout that they have works for seven. I think they just have to have more food. So, and that actually worked in favor of the, uh, uh, the restaurant that they were, they were right next to that actually gave permission to have this set up. The Galloway Grill actually did very well because <laughs> Fall over went to them, so they did fine. So I have some of those involved. That the lunch rush was huge, and then the dinner was a little meager with the supply of those. Oh, they were eating donuts. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so are there hours to uh, the Friday? Yes, morning? they they go from 11, 11 o'clock to eight o'clock. I believe it was. It's uh, all day. And yeah. how did the truck owners or operators? How did they feel about it? From what I've heard, they're very satisfied. They ran out too. Mm -hmm. Very satisfied with what, how it went, okay. and certainly uh, the merchants <coughs> that come too were very happy with it. So I think this is something that's going to stay, um, and maybe even expand out a little bit uh, at some point. Um, the other item here, the uh, Beat Baseball World Series, is going on right now. Um, that's a an event for the visually impaired. It's a it's their World Series. So, so we have uh, 22 teams uh, representing 20 states, and then also two countries, Canada and uh, Taiwan, are here playing in this World Series. That explains why I saw going on in Boyd Park the other day. There were people there, and the balls were weird. And I just now realized it's probably one of the beat balls. I, the one rolled at me. I threw it back, and I had like these like holes like on the telephone. Yep. Like, and it was bang. beeping. Now, not not for the practice. Okay. Well, maybe by the time it got to me, it wasn't beeping anymore. Maybe it wasn't struck. It doesn't beep. Yeah. It was silent. But okay, that's explained why I saw it going on the other day. So how the game is played is that the the pitcher is not someone that's visually impaired. It's someone that it's it's. I think they call them a coach or something, but they pitch the ball, the person that's batting is hitting it. Um, if once they hit the ball, the runner goes down the line to another, and it, it's quite a ways, it's 100 feet that they have to get to that base, but it's making an audio sound, so they're running to the sound. The players are going, that are fielders, are going to the sound of the ball that's been hit, and then they, if they get to the ball and they possess it before the runner gets to the base, the runner is out. If the runner makes it before they secure the ball and say they have it, the runner makes it to first and that counts as a run for the other team and that's how they play the game. And then three outs and then they switch sides. And, and can you um, play it on any field or do you no. play it on the special field? It's a special field. It has, it can, it, it has to be all grass because these, these players are, they're going for it. I mean, they're, they're playing for real. So they're making dives for the ball. And um, so it's all on the grass. And that's why we're doing it at our soccer field. So the field, it's basically painted on <clears throat> and it's all grass. So they're playing in an all grass field. So nothing like a baseball field where you'd have, you know, dirt and clay or something like that. Are there collisions between players going for the ball then? 
there, there, there has and there, there can be, but there are with each player that's out there, the visually impaired player, they have a mentor with them, so they, they can help them in that, so the safety aspect is important because, again, they, even though they're visually impaired, they also <clears throat> wear a mask to cover up the eyes, too, so they, the, the assurance is that they really can't see anything. It's, it's completely dark. So that everybody's lack of sight is equal. Yes. Right. So that's going on now, uh, going on through Saturday. Saturday will be the championship game, and if you get a chance to get out there, I, I would encourage you. Besides the soccer park, it is also being played. A few games are playing at South uh, Middle School and then also at uh, Bollinger Fields. But the majority of the fields and games are being played out on our soccer park. <clears throat> um, the Dragon Boat Festival is coming up this weekend on Saturday. Good news on that is that uh, uh, the water testing for Half Moon Lake uh, was good, so no high bacteria levels. So that's uh, something that has hampered us in the past. And at times have, uh, we've been holding our breath whether we're gonna get a good safe bacteria sample. So everything worked out very well in that respect. And then uh, some, of the, some of the other things will, uh, Festival in the Pines, that's coming up on uh, August 25th. That will be right, uh, right after our next meeting, but that is another uh, event that's been going on in the city for, for many years. I think it's their 39th year for the Festival in the Pines. So we got quite a few in there, so I wasn't going to go through every one, but if you have questions on a specific one, I certainly can. What's the expected date of the completion of the uh, Grand Avenue Bridge uh, redevelopment there? Just in time for uh, dinner on the bridge. So sometime before the 22nd? Yes. It's, uh, they've got the decking is on, they're putting on the okay. railings, <laughs> um, and we, in fact, I just had a meeting with the city engineer and he felt that it would be done most likely the week before that uh, uh, what date was that uh, August 22nd so right before that for that before that date it will be done so it'll be essentially brand new glove it swept off cleaned up mm -hmm. so look it'll look uh, ready for dinner so the uh, September events aren't listed yet. You're going to have that. At the uh, yeah, they'll be coming up for the next, next meeting. meeting. Again, we're we're getting more and more special events that are coming through the city, which uh, you know it's great. It certainly is. It's uh, um, I know I hear from uh, uh, everybody that you know, they're wonderful. They they do stretch our resources out a little bit, but we'll continue to do our best in community services to make sure that we are able to, to accomplish what they what they need to do. Okay. Susan? Can we just ask an informational question? So this is not about one of Eau Claire's parks, but hmm. took my four-year-old granddaughter over to what people had been telling me was a splash pad in the new Altoona Park. Sure. And it's not, to me, it's not my definition of a splash pad, so can you tell me what the definition of a splash pad is? <laughs> I wish we had had a little different footwear than we <laughs> had because it's, you know, there's rocks and they're wet and stuff and she's four. There's a splash, there's like a splash pad over, there's like so a, there is a fountain that comes out of, there is one. Okay, so maybe we just you just get didn't find it. Yeah. <laughs> but there is the the cool you know the thing stream. But I don't know the that kids are actually meant to be in that. But I, they oh, do I anyway. would say that many of them feel that they <laughs> oh, are. Oh, my my do. daughter thought too, like she was swimming underwater. There are many different fashions for a splash pad that can be developed and designed. The the main point of a splash pad is that it's a zero depth. Mm -hmm. That it's not something meant to swim in. But it's meant to enjoy the water, and mm -hmm. and, and there is one. So okay, the, the biggest thing is zero depth. It's just further over. If you go, 
like you know where the I uh, yeah. just just and in between just keep going yeah that's fair um yes because so because I kept telling everyone we we're going to a splash <laughs> pad you know you prepare differently yeah. depending on what they hope and that's kind of what and will be at the at the um new plaza right like the zero depth it's that's going to be a zero depth uh, water water feature. amenity feature. Um, I suppose there will be some people that will take advantage to. I'm pretty sure there's going to be cool splashing in it. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> we haven't seen it yet. I've seen conceptual designs on it, but the one thing we have looked at it is uh, <clears throat> that structure <clears throat> cannot go back into the river. It's got to go water that comes through has got to get recycled and go down through the sanitary sewer so <clears throat> there's a cost to that so we looked at that we had, to, we had to crunch some numbers to make sure that we budget wise we were able to handle what that cost would be okay uh, the special events list is over next item is the director's report well, some of these are meant for July, and July was uh, Parks and Recreation Month, and we had many different uh, activities going on in the city, and I just uh, listed a few of these that were that we had done, and uh, part of that, we had a uh, Parks and Rec Night at the uh, Express game during July. We had uh, some uh, Fairfax Friday Membership Appreciation Day. Um, and then also we did some lunch break skates on Monday through Friday at the Hobbs Ice Center. So again, we did uh, in celebration of the July being Parks and Rec Month, we, we did several different activities around the, the community to celebrate. We were at Fairfax and we did not know there was going to be a bouncy house there. It was very exciting, oh. <laughs> let me tell you. So that must have been a bonus. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> well, great. Um, Fairfax Pool, just a little update on this. No, the numbers have increased since uh, I put this together, but uh, the attendance has exceeded over 26,000 customers. Uh, when I uh, initially put this together, um, I, I don't have the numbers, the current numbers, but we're well over that amount. In fact, we're on pace to be greater than what we were last year. Um, our largest year or the highest number year we had was 70 th 71,000 for the summer um, and you know our summers are very short if we're lucky we can get in there this year we were lucky because uh, Memorial Day was very hot and we ended up having over 11,000 people during just that weekend we had 11,000 and and then you know Sometimes on the weekends they're not as warm, so we, our numbers go down. During the week, you know, when the kids are out, um, we maintain a level. But right now we are on track for that that year end of being close to that record. I'm not sure if we'll make it, but I'll keep you updated on that. So again, warm temperatures, that's going to draw people into the pool. Um, Forestry Division, we continue to work on the uh, emerald ash borer and our ash trees, uh, taking the, we're being very, very uh, proactive to take the trees down before they all start basically falling apart on us. Um, what we have learned from other communities is that once your community is infected with emerald ash borer, the, the death rate of those trees happen very quickly within four years and at that point the trees become very brittle and so we are working within community services we got a very small forestry division <clears throat> we have seven employees that, that do that job what we've done within community services is that we've taken uh, 30 other employees and we put them through a safety program on chainsaw safety how to help out because if it happens we're likely going to see a, a very rather large die off of the ash trees in, in the boulevards and we currently still have about 5,500 ash trees within the boulevard probably in the range of over 30,000 in the community which is on private property 
that's something we don't take care of, but private forestry uh, companies would. So, <clears throat> additionally, what we've also been working with is our street division employees have been uh, doing the stump grinding. So going behind our forestry crew as they take a tree down, we come right behind them, stump grind it, clean that out, restore the boulevard, and then behind that, we have another crew that comes in and, and will plant trees uh, behind it. So we're trying, again, when we're going and selecting trees, we're trying to create a more diverse urban forest. So we're not just planting all elm trees or all ash trees. We're doing, we're trying to get a variety of trees in there. So if there's a die off of one species, it doesn't impact the entire forest. Hey Jeff, yeah. are there other trees that have been identified having a disproportionate percentage of the overall population that would be susceptible to another mass lab? Like, like do you have like more maple trees than okay. we should have or is there any other one that's really a big number? I, I, I don't, I, we, I have that number, I don't have it here, but we do have a inventory of our trees, and we do have some trees that are, it's still a little bit out of whack, I think, uh, in regards to the, the maple trees. Mm -hmm. Again, we haven't seen anything that comes along that's going to affect the, the maple trees. But similar to the oak wilt, you know, Dutch elm disease, you know, we, we want to try to even this out so we've got a, a more diverse. So I have that number. I can get that to you, Josh. I'm just kind of curious if they're not, they haven't yeah. identified and try to plant other stuff to balance the population out a little better. It's not a perfect, you know, with all the species we have, it's not a perfect everything is right together. So we do have a large amount of, and I, I think, if you look at maples, there's a lot of maples we have, but we're working on that. That's something that we're, we're very cognizant of. And we want to make sure we. Is there any, like, perhaps like longer term growth, like they have like, you know, 10 trees, would you just make up 10% of the population or something, some sort of balancing act like that? Yep, I mean, that's what we're trying to get to. Okay. We're trying to get to where it is more of a balance, but we have an inventory, and maybe what I'll do on, on one of the reports, I'll bring some of that data within a forestry, I'll, I'll, I'll go over some of that with you so you can see what that data is. Okay. Um, parks, uh, I mentioned Half Moon Lake. We didn't have any high uh, bacteria counts. I think there was a reason for that. We, we did our uh, goose roundup on July 10th, and we actually reduced the population uh, from on the Chippewa River and the Half Moon Lake, we took a total of 63 geese for a round up. 30 of those came from Half Moon Lake, 33 from uh, Mount Simon and Riverview Park. So again, our, our goal is uh, certainly not to get rid of all of them, but try to control the population because when it does, uh, the main one of the main causes of our, our waterways being high in levels of bacteria is because of the waterfall that's out in these areas. So again, we've talked about this before, the geese that are taken up, they're, uh, they're used up in a uh, raptor rehabilitation area that's used for their uh, food source in those areas. Uh, Recreation Division, uh, we've uh, taken over 5,400 for summer reservations, which includes meal programs. We've been working with the school district with our programming that uh, in some of the areas of the city that uh, there, there's a need uh, for some uh, summer meal programs. Um, so along with our programming in the school, we've been working together and we've actually registered over that many. Um, also with some of the leagues, which include baseball, soccer, t-ball, we registered over 600 and that was a little bit higher since our last time. So. Um, prime times, uh, actually our fall, winter, I, I didn't up that because it just came out, but our fall and winter prime times edition has just come out. So uh, if you're interested, it's online. If you go to the city website under uh, community services, recreation, you'll find our prime times. And, went over special events already. So.
Any questions? Do I, do I remember correctly that in the survey, the large survey that you did of residents, um, that people were interested in, uh, I assumed they were talking about things I remember from being a kid where at a school maybe you have a summer recreation program for maybe crafts and activities and things like that. Uh, that that was something people really hope yes. to have more of. Do we have, what do we have, and is it more? <laughs> well, we, we, I mean, obviously that's the reason why we're working with the, that's the reason why we're working with the school district. We are going and trying to program more of that. Part of the problem is uh, you don't always get the participation or the signing up for it, but we are seeing in areas that you know, certainly there's a need for, for programming and lunch programs. That seems to be very popular right now, so. There's a program called River City Adventures through the Park Park, and um, it's like all summer long, and I paid $10 for Henry for like the whole summer. It's four days a week, and you can go do crafts and play on the playground, go inside, play in the gym, with the school, so it's at Putnam Heights, and there's probably, I think there are like 10 different sites. Yeah, my, my yeah she does it at yeah. So it, there is definitely a, an opportunity, and I don't know how many people they find out, but I know like Putnam Heights is at least 30 kids um, at a time, so that are going every day. It's probably, it's not to the point where it used to be every neighborhood school had a playground. It was, we had programming at every single one of them. It, it has, it's not at that point yet, uh, but it's much more than what we've had in the past. I would, I would say there's at least like 10 sites or something yeah. like that throughout the city. And there's one like at Mitchell Park, which they don't really have Is the um, Lake Bridge still scheduled to be open by the late? I, I, I think we recall that the new bridge between the Confluence and Phoenix Park mm -hmm. was hopefully to be open by Labor Day. Is that um, still the timeline or is it changed? Well, I think the bridge will be done. Unfortunately, the Confluence Plaza will not be done. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, it's hard to go for, on a bridge that goes to a construction site. So oh, okay. the likelihood it's, it's sure. probably not going to be open at that point. Um, um, speaking with the city engineer, it's, it's, it's likely probably more in the neighborhood of uh, late October, November. And we expect to see a lot of registrations coming from that plaza. We've already gotten calls from people that want to reserve it. So. I would imagine it's probably going to be a very popular place for weddings and things like that. Are there any formal and informal names for these bridges? Now we have two pedestrian bridges right next mm -hmm. to each other. Is, is there names that pe people are calling them? The well, the, the one that goes in, that's called the Phoenix Park Bridge. The, and that would have been the old, that was the old railroad bridge. Oh, that, railroad bridge. So that, we refer to that as the Phoenix Park and Bridge. Do you know any of the new one? <laughs> we, haven't got, we haven't gotten there yet. So this is not the time. I'm not sure if you heard the name for that yet. Is it Confluence Bridge, maybe? Yeah, you know, we, I, don't, I haven't heard that conversation. We might need to talk about naming the bridge. Uh, <laughs> no, can we name it? <laughs> <laughs> Do we get that job? Well, maybe that will come before you. We should <laughs> probably have to approve that. <laughs> yeah, that is, I think that's <laughs> no, exactly right. Yeah. That well, might come before you, so. Uh, as soon but as no, I, I have not heard a, a name for it. And then the other bridge that's that's called the Grand Avenue Pedestrian Bridge, I believe that's mm -hmm. still called the Grand Avenue right. Pedestrian Bridge. And they call it the High Bridge, the High Bridge? The High Bridge, the high bridge is a High Bridge. It's mm -hmm. high. So. <laughs> it actually is the uh, Northwestern Bridge is the official, oh, <laughs> Northwestern <laughs> Railroad Bridge. <laughs> on the, uh, the, 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 high, the High Bridge. Okay. High bridge. okay. We are going to be doing a, a historic marker for the High Bridge. Uh, we have a sponsor for that. And we're, the plaque is in production right now. Uh, we'll let you know. We're hoping to do a dedication on that uh, probably September sometime. And we'll have that on. It'll be on the west side of the of the river. 
I think there'll be a lot of confusion once both of the Phoenix Park pedestrian bridges are open because they'll it call it the new hard. bridge. It will be hard. It could be, <laughs> you know, and then a hundred years from now, and it's still the new bridge. <laughs> thing. So the Pretty city big. has a process, kind of a difficult process for naming things. So can we not use that process to come up with a name? We have a Do naming it? policy for parks um, as far as bridges that's um, something we'll have to ex explore and I'll talk about that one. Yeah. Let's leave it after ourselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. This Josh is the, uh, Ron Jenny. the first truly first bridge built in Oak was built as a pedestrian bridge. Is that correct? Uh, well, the uh, well, we'd have, uh, we'd have the university, university. Uh, university bridge, right. Grand okay. Avenue bridge, and it's current. I mean, well, but the, I mean, the originally not, bridge. not a pedestrian yeah. bridge, right? But the campus one, I think. But the one the, 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 on, on campus, and then Boyd, Boyd Park, Boyd Park too. Yeah, the the old yeah. Uh, yeah. bridge. Yes, I think there might be a couple. Somebody should just do a documentary on our. Bridges. We actually did do a, uh, as part of a bike week, we did a uh, bike tour featuring the bridges. And we had, uh, it was in conjunction with the Chippewa Valley Museum. We had gotten, the Chippewa Valley Museum had gotten a grant from the Mayo Foundation. And uh, I worked with uh, the staff from the museum, and we had about 50 people on the bike ride. And, uh, I got some interesting history on the bridges, and it was, it was kind, of, kind of fun. Some of the bridges, like the uh, example, the Phoenix Park Bridge, actually was a bridge that was uh, located down in Iowa, and they uh, disassembled it and brought it up to Eau Claire and, and rebuilt it. So they, some of them have some interesting history. I can, we did a tour like that in like about the 1980s. And Jim Oberly, who's a historian, he and a bicyclist, he led this group, and I stood in front of the museum and watched the 50 people all strung out behind. And I was all I could think of was liability, liability, <laughs> <laughs> because it's you get that long string of people. Now we kept this tour kind of concentrated in the of the core of the downtown area. So we have actually people, uh, well, you're right. We were probably strung out maybe two to three blocks at a couple times, but not, not too bad. We'll have to be careful. It might constitute a special event. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pat, would you open the new prime times, the, the fall winter one, and go to page eight of the PDF? Page eight of the PDF, but page six of the actual publication. Oh, I know that. Okay. I think on the bottom, if you hover, you type zero, says two, or three, six, you type in eight. All right here. Yeah. How about oh. So, yeah, I'll just do this here. And this page. What's that? So scroll down a little bit. Oh. <laughs> so our photo doesn't get published in the, uh, the prime time in case you're unaware. Yeah. And now we have to change it. Have to change it again. Sorry, how they? So it seems like that happens often. So we'll get another picture. It, it won't be in the this prime time, so obviously, but we'll make sure it gets into the spring summer one for next year. Yeah, we still have a an open uh, vacancy on the commission. That's what we're working on a replacement for that. And then I'm next week, uh, Andrew Worthman, Council Member Worthman, is not going to be on the uh, commission anymore. But Terry Weld, who was a uh, past uh, uh, council member that was on it, he'll be back uh, uh, with us. So 
we'll, we'll have something in the agenda for that to welcome mm -hmm. Terry back to the commission. So, so this is still our July meeting. It's not going to replace our regular meeting nope. for us. We'll have an August meeting. Uh, in fact, we, we have some things that we have to get done in August uh, for budget stuff. So. Any other comments for the director's report? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. Susan, Meredith, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, we're adjourned. Oh, thank you for coming tonight. Well, we, this this room will be. We'll be This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148 Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 54702-5148. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.